Hello students, uh, this is Professor Sanjay Iligar here. Uh, I am from BB College of Engineering and Technology, Hubli. So, I am an assistant professor in ENC department over there and my research interest basically include VLSI. So, uh, it is an honor for me to be here to present this course Analog and Digital Electronics, which is for computer science students. So, before I go into this uh, subject, uh, it is always uh, a scenario which happens like, okay, I am a CS student, why, am, why should I study this analog subject, why should I study this electronic subject. So, well, I can only say that uh, you can, nothing is a single discipline in today's world. So, everything that we see like you cannot say okay, I am only going to be a programmer, I am not going to be a systems engineer and I cannot say that I uh, will only be a hardware engineer and I will not be a programmer. So, the real world out there requires both the skills for any student which comes out of engineering graduation program. In that context, I urge all the students to take this subject also equally seriously, so that you become an overall systems engineer once you go into the industry. Okay, so, let me just quickly run through uh, what is the content that you have for this particular course. The course objectives for this course are, this should enable the students to recall and recognize construction and characteristics of JFETs and MOSFETs and differentiate the same with respect to BJTs. As you all know, BJTs would have been studied by you all in the first year of engineering and to some extent also in the plus 2 programs after your schooling. Next, the objective would be to demonstrate and analyze operational amplifier circuits and their applications. Thirdly, describe, illustrate and analyze combinational logic circuits, simplification of algebraic equations using K maps and Queen Mikulski techniques. Moving on, the next three objectives of this particular course are, it should enable the students to describe and design decoders, encoders digital multiplexers, adders and subtractors, binary comparators, latches and master slave flip flops. Now, all these are basically the blocks that we call as a digital blocks. Then describe, design and analyze synchronous and asynchronous sequential circuits. Finally, the course winds up with a mix of analog as well as digital, which we call as mixed signal circuits and they typically involve the conversion from analog to digital and vice versa. So, last objective is to explain in design registers and counters A to D and D to A converters. So, hopefully by the end of this entire course, you should be able to achieve all these objectives and it will be an our endeavor to try to teach you as many concepts as we can and try to learn together as we go along. Now, as far as the course modules are concerned, we are going to have these modules as far as uh, the first uh, based on the chapters that you basically have. So, what we typically call as a content or syllabus for your particular course. So, broadly we can uh, call these chapters as FETs, basic gates, data processing circuits, flip flops, counters. The textbooks that has been prescribed by the VTU are Anil Maini and Varsha Agarwal, which is electronic devices and circuits by Wiley publication from which we are going to take majority of the content as far as the first session is concerned, which I will be handling. Next, there is a Donald Leach and Malvino Saha Digital Principles and Applications, which is a Tata McGraw-Hill edition. So, moving on to the first module, which will be handled. This we are going to split it into seven sessions, which is essentially actually a 10 hour delivery program. So, we are squeezing it into seven hours to cover the most important aspects the remaining 3 hours we expect the students to go back and hone their skills further and build on these concepts by solving additional problems or by referring the reference books. So, the 7 sessions which I have been uh, identified are FETs which include JFET and enhancements MOSFET, then depletion MOSFETs, differences between JFETs and MOSFETs and biasing MOSFETs which is a large topic dividing it into 2 sessions. Then moving on we have FET applications and CMOS devices. 
The last three sessions would be something called as a wave shaping circuits, where we will be discussing with the IC wave shaping circuits and not the discrete device circuits. Then we introduce you to the operational amplifier and some of the applications which use this op amps, which go on till active filters, amplifiers and finally to voltage to convert current converter and current to voltage converter. So, again I welcome you all to this uh, particular session. So, let us get started by doing this first session which is on field effect transistors. Essentially we will be covering JFETs and enhancement MOSFETs. Now, before we start with this particular session, let us try to see what is the learning outcome that we expect out of this session. Now, upon successful completion of this session, the student should be able to acquire the knowledge of JFETs and MOSFETs. The student should also be able to analyze the performance of JFETs and enhancement MOSFETs. So, with these outcomes in mind, let us start with the first session. Now, we all would have studied the various devices starting from a schooling into the college and also in the first year of engineering. We have been introduced to a device called as a PN junction diode to start with and then we were introduced to something called as BJTs which we call as bipolar junction transistors. Now, how are these two going to vary? Now, since we have already studied BJT, why is it that we should study FETs? So, let us start this topic by giving a context as to why we have to move on to FETs. Was not studying BJT good enough? Why should I study one more device? That is a usual grouse of many students. But as we know, technology keeps advancing and always for betterment. So, let us see the main comparisons or advantages vis-a-vis -vis BJTs and FETs. Now, primarily BJTs are current control devices uh, that typically we say collector current and base current. We all must remember the equation I c is equal to beta times I b that is basically the current amplification which is happening. So, you control the base current uh, by controlling the base current you can control the output load current whereas in FETs it is going to be a voltage control device wherein we control we apply the control voltage at the gate while the output current can be modified or adjusted accordingly. That is why we call it as a voltage control device. And then moving on to the type of charge carriers which are used. Now, as we all know right from p n junction diode it consists of two types of charge carriers. So, can, can you guess what are the two charge carriers? Well, L, well you said it right yeah the two charge carriers are electrons and holes. So, we call that as bipolar device. So, if it is a n p n transistor we call electrons as a majority carriers while we call holes as the minority carriers. If it is a PNP transistor, we call it holes as the majority carriers and electrons as minority carriers. That means, both these charge carriers contribute to the overall current. Whereas, in FET it is just one type of charge carrier which operates or causes amplification or uh, as a FET. So, which is it can either be of N type where only electrons are the charge carriers or it can only be of P type where only holes are the charge carriers. So, that is another major difference between these two. Then as far as the third one is the most important part as far as a low input impedance is concerned for BJTs now that becomes a problem. We need to have the input impedance for any device when it is used as an amplifier as high as possible. Now, why is it so? Suppose let us say I am having a signal which is driving at the input of this device. Now, if the device has a very low input impedance, it has a tendency to load the source in the sense the source will get loaded. If on the other hand I have a very high input impedance, I will not be loading the source. That is a good advantage to have. So, wherever we have low noise amplifiers, FETs are the best choice as compared to BJTs. Plus, then coming on to fabrication or what we call as construction, it is much, much complex when you are doing in case of a BJT whereas, in case of an FET the fabrication is much much simpler it involves much less number of steps. By fabrication what do you mean? We keep saying that it is a N P N transistor. So, we need to have a N type doping, a P type doping and another N type doping as a base emitter and collector. So, that is called as fabrication we have to do it in various steps sequentially one after the other. So, which is typically more complex in a BJT as opposed to that in a FETs. So, that is an advantage we have for FET fabrication. But 
is FET good good everywhere? No, it has a slight drawback in terms of the gain that a single stage device can provide. BJT has a much much larger gain as compared to FET. So, that is the only uh, sore point as far as FETs are concerned, but nowadays even that is also taken care of. We have something called as a bi CMOS devices where it uses BJTs at the output stage while it uses FETs in the processing stage. So, thereby I can have the best of both worlds. Then finally, uh, there is also one more thing FETs you need to handle very very carefully because static electricity in your fingertips can damage the chips or the ICs or the devices. So, that is not the case with BJTs. So, net net we can say uh, 4 is to 2 when it comes to FETs and BJTs, but looking at the cost, looking at the compactness and the volume, the shrinkage FETs allows you to do in a chip, FETs has far far overtaken BJTs. Okay, so, let us move on then and try to see what these FETs are all about. Now, as we kept on saying FETs, so FET is an acronym for like JFET is an acronym for junction field effect transistors. So, how is a uh, construction or the way in which this particular JFET looks like? Now, here we are showing you two such devices as I said it is a unipolar device. So, we are going to have a N type JFET and we are going to have a P type JFET. So, accordingly you can see the construction here in this particular slide we have a huge piece of N type material onto which we have doped two P type junctions. Okay. So, bear in mind, so this particular thing is now a three terminal device wherein we call one as a drain, one as a source and one as a gate. Now, we are trying to show the gate as connected to each other, but what actually is it that we are showing here is a cut section of this particular device. So, it appears as we have gate on one end, but okay, fine. So, the three terminals will now be called as drain, the source and the gate. Likewise, if you want to have a P channel JFET, then we are going to have a P semiconductor onto which you dope two types of two regions at gate which are of N type. Now, to understand the behavior of this JFET, we need to revisit one concept as far as semiconductor devices is concerned. So, that concept is a concept of what we call as the depletion region. So, can anyone tell what a depletion region is all about? Okay. So, let me just try to move to the board here and try to ask you some questions. So, basically we all know that we have what we call as a p n junction diode. So, this would be the schematic of a p n junction diode. We call this as a p type and we call this as a n type. But then how does it look as far as the construction is concerned? So, we are going to have a p type material on one side and we are going to have a n type material on the other side. Now, what happens is the moment you have a p type on one side, the moment you have a n type on the other side, what do you have in the middle here? Is it going to be an abrupt transition from p type to n type? No, right? We are going to have some region in between these two. Now, that region we call as depletion region, you are right. So, what does the depletion region mean? Depletion region means that particular region is devoid of any charge carriers. We have majority of holes on this side and we have majority of electrons on this side, whereas we do have minority electrons here and minority holes here. Now, these holes they try to move from this side to this side thereby leaving what we call as a negative ion behind because I am going to lose a positive charge from the p side to the n side. Likewise, an electron which moves from this side to that side leaves behind a positive fixed ion. So, the entire region between the p and n type now becomes devoid of any of the charge carriers which we call as the depletion region meaning that region is depleted of any charge carriers. So, let us go back then that means what have I given any potential here? No, just by merely having a p type diffusion on one side a n type diffusion on other side I am going to have a depletion region. Now, this width of the depletion region can be altered if I apply what we call as an external bias. Now, we have something called as a forward bias and we have something called as a reverse bias. 
Now, can someone tell me what would be a forward bias for a PN junction, right? So, we are going to connect the P type to the positive of the battery and we are going to connect the N type to the negative of the battery. So, this we call as forward bias. If you forward bias a junction, the width of the depletion region would reduce, while if we do the reverse of it in the sense, if I am going to replace this voltage source by an opposite one like connecting the P type to negative and connecting the N type to positive. So, what is this happening now? The positive here will attract all the electrons from this side and the negative here would attract all the holes from this side. So, what would happen? You would have the widening of the depletion region. So, this reverse bias diode we know it increases the width of depletion region. Now, this is one concept which we need to apply in understanding the behavior of a J fit. If we do not know that by applying a reverse bias the width of depletion region increases then we cannot understand the operation. Increasing the voltage further it goes on widening, but to what extent? Beyond a point we have something called as breakdown. So, what breakdown? I am giving you a hint here. Yes, it is called as an avalanche breakdown. Okay. Once you exceed the reverse voltage beyond a point the diode simply breaks and you no longer have a junction called PN junction, we just have one full piece of semiconductor material. So, let us move back to the J fit now and try to understand how we can apply this concept to understanding the behavior of J fit. Before we move on just the symbol like how just like we have a symbol for the diode here, we also have a symbol for J fit if you can see it in the slide here. Now, uh, N type J fit you can see the only difference is it has the arrow mark pointing inside whereas, a P type has the arrow mark pointing outside. Apart from that there is no difference as far as symbol is concerned very similar to what we have in NPN and a PNP whereas, in BJTs the arrow mark do you remember where the arrow mark was in a BJT? Yes, right it was on the emitter whereas, in this case the arrow mark is shown on the gate terminal. Okay. So, arrow mark going inside is a NJ fit going outside from the gate is a P type J fit. Now, how do we see the operation of this J fit? When we see operation of J fit all I have to do is control the voltage and see the current because at the end of the day we kept on saying that FET is a voltage control device. So, what to do next then? Apply a voltage and see how the current can be modulated or how the current can change. For that we need to have a circuit configuration. So, the circuit configuration for finding out those characteristics is given here. Initially we do not apply any gate to source voltage in the sense we short both gate as well as source which ensures that we have VGS as 0. And then we are going to apply a voltage here between drain and source. Okay. So, this is the schematic connection and this is how the actual connection looks like. Now, immediately after applying the positive voltage to the drain terminal and the negative to the source terminal, you can see the depletion region now changing its pattern. Let me go back to the previous two slides and see what was happening there when it was not biased. When it was not biased you can see there the depletion regions were of constant width see the same way it is very similar to an unbiased P n junction. Okay. Now, the moment you start applying the bias what is the applied bias here now? I am connecting the P type sorry the N type here to positive. So, just like in case of a diode if you connect the N type to the positive it is reverse bias while the P type if you can see here the P type is you can see the connections here the P type is connected to the negative. So, P to negative and positive to the N type ensures that it is now a reverse biased junction. Not only that the moment you have a reverse bias junction you can see the depletion region width same. Now, you may ask the question why is the width larger here than here? We will come to that a bit later, 
but before that let us try to understand how the current flows with the voltage being applied. So, for that let us try the help of uh, animation here and it will help us understand these concepts in a much more simpler fashion. So, this, this is the case now I have a N fit here wherein my VGS is 0 volts and I am not applying any drain to source voltage also. So, just like we saw in the previous slide the red the orange one is the depletion width there is hardly any depletion region here. So, and there is no current also in this channel. Now, we call this region in between the drain and source as the channel. Now, let us see I will slowly increase the drain to source voltage from 0 volts I will move on to 1 volt. So, what you can see now the positive of it it attracts the electrons right because electrons being negatively charged they get attracted towards the positive of the pole. So, what we have is the flow of electrons from the source side to the drain side. So, if the electrons flow from source to drain where does the conventional current flow? Now, as per the basics of physics we know that the direction of flow of conventional current is always opposite to the flow of electron current. So, if we say that the current is electrons are flowing from source to drain then we can say the current is flowing from drain to source. Do not get confused here it is a convention that has been going on. So, if electrons flowing from source to drain current is flowing from drain to source. Now, you can see the rate at which these electrons are moving from source to drain. Now, can I increase this rate at which they are moving? Let us see by increasing the voltage a bit more further. Also, I urge you to observe this depletion region width very carefully. Okay. So, now I am moving from 1 volt now I take it to 2 volts. So, what you can see now current is started increasing. Why? Because the applied voltage creates larger potential difference larger the potential difference larger is going to be the rate at which electrons flow and hence more current. Okay. So, does that mean it will go on increasing? Let us see, let us see. So, let me now take it to something called as 3 volts and now you see there something happening right increasing it further, further right. Now, this is the very interesting part what is actually happening here? The width of the depletion region on the drain side is more as compared to the width at the source side. Why this happens? Any guesses? Okay. A very simple way to explain this concept. If current is flowing from drain to source, what does that mean? Drain is at a higher potential than source. So, that means what? This region of the P type is experiencing a larger reverse bias as opposed to the source region which is not having because it is at ground. So, essentially no bias there. So, once this happens as we studied in the context of a pn junction diode larger the reverse bias larger is going to be the depletion width. Now, as you go on increasing the voltage you reach a point what we call as a pinch off point wherein these two uh, junctions they simply touch each other and after that we do not have any current flowing. So, this entire thing now can be seen from this point. So, now I, I urge you to look at the graph here on the graph on the left side. So, what is happening? The current is slowly increasing from 0 to 20 milliampers and then it is saturating at some point. Okay. So, I will again redo this slide, but now I expect you to look at the graph there and see how the behavior works. So, you can see the green line there it starts from 0. Okay. Now, this region we call as a ohmic region. Why ohmic region? Because increase in the applied voltage is causing a increase in the current. Okay. But beyond a point what we call as the pinch off point. Now, what is this pinch off point? Pinch off point means the depletion region at the drain end touches each other. Once this happens no matter how much of increase the drain voltage the current remains constant. So, this we call as the saturation region. Now, let us go back to our slide and see what actually happens at pinch off. Okay. So, this is the same curve which we showed there for V j s equal to 0. Now, what if V j s is made either larger than 0 or it is made 
less than 0. Let us see what will happen in that case. Okay. So, let us go back to the diagram here. Now, I am increasing the VGS further. So, what will happen now? So, you can see there the current is reducing. Okay. I am trying to show you the pinch off point now. See there, this is what I mean by the pinch off point. right? It totally touches each other and you no longer have any current flowing if VGS is increased much, much more. Now, if you have observed, I am giving a negative gate to source voltage. So, giving a negative gate to source voltage further reverse biases this junction okay, and causes an increase in the depletion width. So, you can see the curve on the left side also the bar is now moving downwards. Okay? So, you are going to have different sets of curves. The blue one is a 1 now for Vj is equal to minus 2 volts. I can, I can increase the negative voltage, the current goes on reducing. So, what does that mean now? A larger negative gate voltage increases the depletion width further and you can see there the current also reduces to a lot extent. So, this way I can modulate the current which flows in the channel. Okay? I will I can, I'll show you how I am doing a gate control, okay? that is the idea. So, 0 voltage at the gate, the current is the highest. Okay? I can see there, you can see that the current is flowing pretty fast. Now, I go on giving a negative bias, see the currents are starting to reduce. The number of electrons you are able to see, they are reducing. So, what does that basically mean? I am able to modulate the current in the channel by applying or controlling the gate to source voltage. This is what we call as voltage controlled device. Applying the voltage at the gate, modulating the current at the output. So, this would uh, clear all the doubts you have as to uh, how this particular thing is operating. Okay. So, let us move on then. The same thing that we are trying to show here, earlier VGS was 0, now we are giving a negative voltage. So, how does it become a further reverse bias? Okay. It was a P type if you remember. You had N type drain, N type source and you had a P type gate. So, a P type gate connected to the negative of VGG. So, that means it is a reverse bias again. So, adding additional reverse bias at the gate causes the depletion width to increase further and thereby reduce the current even further. This is the overall set of curves for various values of VGS. Now, what happens if I go on increasing the reverse bias further okay, or I go on increasing the VDS further? So, as you can see in these curves, just like you have an avalanche breakdown in a PN junction, here also we are going to have an avalanche breakdown. Okay? So, as you can see here, for very large gate voltages, you go into a breakdown region wherein the current suddenly shoots up. Why the current shoots up? You no longer have a junction, it is just a piece of semiconductor material with very low resistance. So, current shoots up from milli amperes to even amperes and it actually destroys the JFET. You can no longer recover from that situation once you go into a breakdown region. Now, how do we classify these regions here? Now, we have something called as the ohmic region and we have something called as a saturation region. Now, why do we call ohmic region? It is a very straightforward concept. What does an ohm relation mean? The voltage is directly proportional to R. So, larger the voltage, larger would be the resistance here. And then we have beyond the pinch off point, we are going to have what we call as a saturation region. Now, there is an equation which governs this particular resistance. So, if I am operating in the ohmic region, my equation for resistance is given by this. Rd is equal to R naught divided by 1 minus Vgs upon Vp whole square, where Vp is the voltage at which pinch off occurs, the drain to source voltage at which pinch off occurs. Now, if you want to increase the resistance, what should you possibly do? Should you increase the VGS or reduce the VGS? Can you just answer that by means of a question by looking at the graph or looking at the equation? Both are possible. Let us start with the equation first. So, increasing VGS, what would happen? My denominator would reduce. So, if the denominator is reducing, okay? so then the overall figure is going to increase. So, larger the value of VGS, larger is going to be what? Fine. So, let us go back to the board here and try to see what do you mean by resistance and what do you mean by the slope. Okay. I will just rub this. 
Okay, so Ohm's law says V is proportional to I. Now, this proportionality constant is what we call as resistance. So, V is equal to R into I. If I were to draw the graph of this, what would happen? Okay, I will give on the x axis if I give V, x on the y axis if I give I, then this would be the nature of the graph at v equal to 0, i would also be 0. Now, what is this a slope now? This slope is given by what? If I can call this as delta i, okay? delta i and if I can call this as delta v, then what is i upon v here? i upon v would be actually 1 upon r, yes or no? Okay? Because I am taking v here, r goes here. So, this slope is actually giving me the inverse of the resistance. Okay? Likewise, now we go back to the slide here and if you can see each of these uh, waveforms over here, now they are going to have different sets of slopes. Okay? This is the one which has a much, much lesser slope as compared to this one which has a higher slope. So, higher the slope means what? We already seen slope is inverse of resistance. So, higher the slope, lesser the resistance. So, this way also you can analyze this resistance. Once we know the ohmic region, then can we define some equation for the saturation region? Okay? And by the way, what is this R naught here? R naught would be the value of the resistance at VGS equal to 0. Okay? Now, once it is in the saturation region, what is the current that we are looking at? The current would be I d is equal to I d s s 1 minus V g s upon V p square. Again, what is this I d s s? Now, I d s s is the saturation current for V g s equal to 0. Thereafter, for any larger value, when I say larger value, larger negative value of V g s, the current goes on reducing further and this equation is a famous Shockley equation in the sense a square law equation which is a very powerful uh, analysis which helped these FETs and even MOSFETs as we go down being used in many of the communication devices like tuners and all. The reason being if you have a square law device it is going to produce the even number of harmonics so that your noise is going to be reduced whereas in BJT it is not a square law it is a direct law like IC is equal to beta into IB. So, there you have more noise whereas in FET it is going to have much lesser noise that is why that is the reason we are using FETs in low noise amplifiers. Now, moving on, the previous characteristics we called them as the output characteristics. Why output? Because current is the output okay? and VDS is also the output. So, an output voltage versus output current is called as an output characteristics. Now, we can also plot what we call as the transfer characteristics. What does transfer mean? In to out. Now, what is the input in our case? The input in our case is VGS and the output continues to be the drain current. So, you can do a calculation from the graph also or you can also use the graphical method or you can also use the equations to establish a relation between VGS and ID. It is an exponential uh, relations which we are having. So, you can see here the current is maximum when VGS is 0. As you go on applying a negative gate to source voltage, the current goes on reducing down and this is how the graph would look like. So, this we call as the transfer characteristics. Okay. So, far what we have done is all about n type j fet or what we call as n channel j fet. Now, we also saw that we also have a p channel j fet. So, what would that be the difference between these two? If you were to analyze everything would look the same, only the polarities would get changed. If V d s would be positive there, here V d s would become negative. If I d was positive there, here I d would become negative. So, if you can see here, we have just shown just one shot the curves, wherein you can see the entire output characteristics looking the same, but you need to observe what is there on the x axis. It is negative value of V d s and negative value of ID. So, rest all analysis remains the same. So, once you analyze the n channel J fit, the p channel J fit has got to be the same 
with the exception that all the voltages will have a reverse polarity, all the currents will also have the reverse polarity. Okay. So, that is it as far as the j fits were concerned, we have seen the n channel j fit in detail. Now, we just showing a snapshot of what a p channel j fit would look like. Now, moving on to another type of device which we call as MOS FET, very famous, very popular and widely used device beyond BJTs and JFETs also. Now, what does MOSFET stands for? As we are showing there, it is metal oxide field effect transistor. It is also a voltage control device, but we have an insulator in between the gate and the channel which we will see in the next few slides. Let us briefly give you a snapshot as to what is it that we are going to cover in these MOSFETs. So, we have two types of MOSFETs, not talking about the N type or P type, the two varieties of MOSFETs which we call as enhancement MOSFETs and depletion MOSFETs. And then we go on to see the difference between the JFETs and MOSFETs and eventually we are going to do the biasing of MOSFETs. Okay. So, this is a typical construction of a enhancement type MOSFET. Now, before I keep using this word enhancement and depletion, let me quickly tell you what is the difference between these two. So, if you can observe the construction here, we have again a three terminals, but the difference is we also have a fourth terminal which we now call as a substrate. So, essentially JFET where three terminal devices whereas MOSFETs are four terminal devices. The three terminals remain the same, the source, the gate, the drain plus the substrate. So, the su construction here we can see here these are the drain and the source regions and you have a substrate which is of P type. So, there is no connection between source and drain whereas in JFET there was always a channel where the current could pass. In this case, there is no channel which is present. Okay. That means what? How does it work then? It only works when you apply a gate voltage. Uh, once you apply a positive gate voltage here, a channel is formed. That is why we call it as an enhancement type MOSFET. Whereas, in a depletion type MOSFET, even though if you do not apply any gate, there would already be a channel between the drain and a source, alike, just like a JFET sort of a thing. Okay. The major difference is, you can see here, this is the gate terminal, it is no longer connected directly to the substrate or the P type terminal. We have a oxide or an insulator in between which is typically called as a silicon dioxide as an insulator the SiO2 that we have shown here. Okay. And how are these contacts taken from the semiconductors? By means of uh, ohmic contacts or metal contacts as the case may be. So, what is the difference between the N type enhancement and a P type enhancement? The only difference is we have highly doped source and drain regions of N type where as a P type as a substrate, whereas in a P enhancement we have a highly doped drain and source regions over a N type substrate. Okay, so, that is the difference. So, let us move on and tell the symbol of it and then move on to the operation of it. So, it may look a slightly tricky symbol here, but you do not have to worry. The only difference here is you can also use this 4 channel MOSFET as a 3 channel, I mean sorry, uh, a 4 pin MOSFET as a 3 pin MOSFET. Now, the 4 pins are gate, source, drain and the substrate. Now, if you do not want to use the 4th terminal, you can always short it to the source, which is usually done over here like this. Again, if it is N type, the arrow mark is going inside, if it is a P type, the arrow mark is going outside, very similar to what is a convention for JFETs. The another point which you have to note here is the line between the drain and source is a dotted line. It is not by mistake, it is by design. In the sense, we are trying to depict through this symbol that the drain and source are generally not electrically connected when there is no gate voltage applied. Only upon application of the gate voltage will there be a connection between drain and that is why we show it as a dotted line, means there is no connection between drain and source. So, this is a N type and this is a P type. Now, let us see the operation of a MOSFET. Again, we will try to see or use the benefit of 
simulation for this one. Okay. So, this is the this is a particular uh, animation that we are trying to do for ok. So, we have a source region here and we have a drain region here plus we also have a bulk here which is of p type and you are going to have the n type source and drain plus the gate. Initially, I do not connect any voltage between gate and source. You can see here gate and source I am, I am making gate and source as 0. Likewise, I am not going to connect any voltage between drain and source that means, I am going to keep V d s as 0. So, if you see the graph here there is no current flowing between drain and source and we say the device is in cutoff state. Now, how do you turn the device on? To turn the device on we need to have a channel between drain and source. When do we have the channel? We need to apply a gate voltage which is larger than a voltage which we call as threshold voltage. So, let us try and do that here by giving a larger gate voltage. The moment I give a larger gate voltage you can see what happens is the electrons which were minority carriers in the p substrate they are moving up towards the interface. Now, can they go and reach the gate? No, they cannot reach the gate. Why? Because you have an insulator in between the gate and the p type substrate, but the electrons they go and they get accumulated below the surface just like in case of a capacitor right. What do you have in a capacitor? You can have the charges come and sit on the plates, but they cannot cross from one plate to the another. So, go on increasing the gate voltage further. Now, you can see the channel has been formed. I will increase the voltage here. You can see the depth of this channel goes on increasing. That means, more number of electrons are coming beneath the channel. So, does that mean I have a current now? I should have right. I have a gate here which has caused me a channel to be formed. I have a connection between drain and source. So, why should not any current be flowing? But the very simple fact for any current to flow between drain and source you need to have a potential difference between drain and source. Right now what is the potential difference? 0 volts. So, if the voltage between drain and source is 0 you will not have any current flowing from drain to source. So, let us sweep these electrons from source by increasing the drain voltage and simultaneously let us also observe what happens on the curve. Okay. So, let me make my VGS as VDS as 1 volts, my VGS is already 5 volts. <coughs> so, as you can see here we already have a current now which is flowing from source to the drain. I will increase the drain to source voltage further. <coughs> so, you can see here the drain voltage is increased you can observe the simulation here. Pause <laughs> ok. So, there you go then. So, uh, increasing the VDS further is going to cause an increase in VGS to what extent? So, let us go back from 0. For V d s equal to 1 volt, there is a some amount of current here as shown. Increase it further, also observe the channel here. The depth of the channel is becoming smaller here. This is again very similar to what we called as a pinch off effect in JFET. Okay. The reverse bias at the drain end is much larger as compared to the source end. So, the channel depth here is reduced. Increase the drain voltage further and I reach what I call as a pinch off. Pinch off means there is no longer any channel at the drain end. So, beyond this point no matter whatever is the increase in the VDS it will not cause any increase in the current. Okay. So, that is seen here I am increasing VDS beyond no increase in the current whatsoever beyond the pinch off. So, likewise what happens if I increase the VGS further? So, from 5 volts let me take it to 10 volts what will happen? Definitely much much larger current why because the channel width is much much longer. So, this is how a MOSFET operates in the sense by controlling the gate voltage I can modulate the drain current. The drain current is also depending on the drain to source voltage, but only up to a point called as a pinch off. Beyond pinch off I go into saturation 
and before pinch off I go into what we call as a ohmic region or the triode region and when Vgs is less than the threshold voltage I no longer have any channel and so I call that as a cutoff region. So, this was what uh, the operation of uh, n channel enhancement MOSFET was ok. So, this is again depicting the pinch off condition wherein the depletion region is much much larger at the drain end thereby it is causing the depth of the channel to become 0 at drain end. This is called as a pinch off condition beyond which it enters saturation. Just like we have output characteristics curves means what output voltage V d s versus output current I d for J fit likewise also we have output characteristics here the curves are pretty much similar ok. So, for increasing value of V g s you are going to have much much larger current whereas in J fit what was happening the current was the highest at V g s equal to 0 and for a negative V g s it was reducing. We also have something called as a transfer characteristics again what does transfer mean output current versus input voltage this is what depicts the voltage controlled device behavior I am able to change the voltage and then get a change in the current. So, uh, we can now sum up the entire session here what is it that we have done in this entire session we started by seeing the construction and operation of the junction field effect transistor and then we moved on to the enhancement type metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors which we call as a MOSFETs. Then we studied the output curve as well as the transfer curve for both the devices. Before we wind up uh, can we just have one or two questions so that uh, we can understand what whether we are being able to understand this fully. So, I will just float one or two questions. So, let us see whether you all will be able to answer this. Now, my first question would be on if you can move to the board my first question would be on J fits ok. So, how many terminals does a J fit have ok the J fit is having three terminals right. So, what are those three terminals those are the gate the drain and the source. Now, how about MOSFET is MOSFET also having only three terminals no right it has four terminals ok the answer is right. So, MOSFETs are going to have four terminals which are gate drain source plus we also have something called as a substrate ok. So, the next question would be in a J fat when is the current the highest I have two scenarios wherein in the first case I have my V g s equal to 0 volts and in the second scenario I am going to have V g s equal to minus 2 volts. So, when do you think the current would be the highest right. So, the current in J fit is highest when V g s is 0 thereafter it sort of depletes the channel and so the current reduces. Whereas, in case of MOSFETs let me give a condition for n channel where V g s is 0 volts and again when V g s is 2 volts. So, in which case the current is higher it is exactly the opposite right. So, in V g s in 0 there is essentially no current flowing and even at 2 volt if it is the threshold voltage again no current right. So, if our answer was you have more current at V g s equal to 2 you may again be wrong it depends on if this is the V t the threshold voltage then you will not have any current. So, only if the gate voltage is larger than the threshold voltage you will have the higher current. So, larger the value of gate to source voltage larger would be current in a MOSFET. So, with that we will just sort of sum up this entire thing. So, I urge students to delve deeper into this two devices the J fit and the enhancement MOSFET in the next session we will come with the depletion MOSFETs and it will take on from there ok. Thank you, thank you one and all.